out of, at random out of the phone book one day, called him up. Within a few months, my wife had come to Christ, and she kept going to those counseling sessions, and pretty quickly I realized I didn't want to do that because this guy was suddenly calling me to be responsible as a husband and a father, and you know he yeah. was really reading my mail and, and talking about my lifestyle and so on. And uh, finally, after kicking and screaming for a couple of years, I came to Christ, and very quickly God called us into ministry. And uh, in the first five years of the ministry, I wrote three books that dealt with the secular music industry because it was something I knew and understood. And and I really didn't uh, didn't know where God wanted us to go or what He wanted us to do. I just knew I couldn't stay in the recording studio where I was. I was managing a state of the art studio north of Seattle, Washington. And uh, I knew I couldn't stay there, and I didn't know how I'd feed my family or what I'd do, but I knew that I, I was finished with that. It was a God to me. It was an idol to me. And I didn't know everything about the Bible. Still don't. I'm still learning like we all are. But I would found out enough that I realized that I could no longer stay in that business and, and, uh, and be true to the convictions that, I'd, that I had. When I got saved, as many people have, when I got saved, I really got saved. I mean, it was a radical conversion. I was yeah. delivered the morning that I received Christ of all the drugs and the alcohol, all the stuff I'd done for 14 years of my life. I've been been on the dr- on drugs, and I just come off a weekend binge on cocaine. I was spending a thousand, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred bucks a week on my cocaine habit, and so that's that's where life was at to, with me. And it was a night and day experience I had, and so. Uh, or should I say a night two day experience? But that's what happened to me. And and very quickly he called us into ministry and and I began uh, uh, writing these books and then speaking wherever doors were open. And then you know as time moves on, more people find out about you. And a lot of that happened because of Christian talk radio and some of the some of the people who had me on in the early days. Marlon Maddox, who has gone on to be uh, with the Lord here several yeah. years ago, he was really instrumental in helping us get started and. And uh, from there, moved into more of apologetics and dealing with the defense of the faith and talking about uh, more of the cults and the New Age movement and the occult and the, the books you just mentioned that I've authored. And, and now today I'm dealing a lot with stuff that's going on inside the church as we see good, sound, once sound evangelical churches begin to waffle on doctrine or give up on, on truth and begin to in, embrace more emergent philosophies, and that's the stuff I deal with now today. So that's kind of a, a nutshell look at what happened in our lives. Wow. And I'm sitting here looking at your um, – I, I got the view thing on. I don't have the um, download. I had that on earlier. And, uh, I mean, wow. Um, and if you listen to, to this ministry, anybody out there, you guys know where we're coming from. Um, most of this is uh, – Pretty fascinating to to this to the host of this show. Um, wow, uh, emergent church. Uh, let me let me ask you a question. Um, I, I I'm sort of looking at things different than I did uh, a couple of years ago, and I, I'm pretty much sure even at 42 years old, there's time for um, growth uh, as long as you stay true to the Word of God. Uh, it looks like to me. And I can't put my finger on it that all the all the movements and all the books are being written and all the music. It seems to me that everything's aiming towards God being a God. And I don't know if I just put jumped over the mule and got on the horse and took off, but um, everything seems to be centering towards. A God within you, and what I mean by that is um, most of the uh, books, like the Shack and the um, uh, and Purpose Driven, uh, and and some of the movements seem to be taking some taking baby steps, some taking giant leaps. Uh, and I know I know the Shack is fiction, but it seems like to me that everything out there from from the movies. To the music is sort of taking different levels, but taking an approach towards being a god. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Or am I just sound ridiculous? I, I no, no. Let let me. Uh, I mean, several things come up in that in your in your statement. Your question both is um, one thing I want to I want to mention. Folks that say, wait a second, you're going to pick on everything. Well, listen, I, I'd be glad to give kudos and give thumbs up when I see something that, that is 
preaching truth and standing with truth and not waffling on the scriptures and all those kind of things. When it comes to the book The Shack, even though it is fiction, and I'm, I make it very clear in the articles I've written about it, you can folks can kind of track those articles and see all the rest of our stuff at ericbarger.com. And I guess I should spell that for folks just so they can get it right because I know it's important. It's E R I C B A R G E R. That's ericbarger.com. And, uh, you know, when I wrote about this, I got a lot of flack about it. But, you know, just because something's fiction doesn't mean we should test it any way different. God doesn't tell us to test fiction any different than reality. The scripture says test all things, and especially if something comes along and claims to be of God. And, by the way, uh, the author of the shack told me personally in a 15- to 20-minute conversation I had with him, uh, he told me personally that he knew the book was teaching theology. So he knows this. And he's now come out of the closet, very open about the fact that he believes in universalism, that everyone is already saved. And he believes that uh, the substitutionary atonement of Christ isn't really what we've always made it out to be, that when Christ stood in substitute for my sins and for yours and for everyone else listening, that that really wasn't what it was because he says that makes the God of the Bible uh, some sort of a of a cosmic evil god that would do that to his own son, and I say it's the most loving act a god could ever do. Who would, who uh, knows that no one with sin can stand in his presence? He wanted to build a bridge back to himself, which is what he did when he sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place. And all we have to do is accept it and then follow him, you know. But anyway, so that's one thing that comes to my mind. The the thing you're saying about that you believe that so much of the the Christian media or the stuff that claims to be Christian that's out there today, and sadly much of it, people don't have the discernment. They're not using biblical discernment to know. They're they're going on whether something claimed to be Christian, Philip, instead of whether it really is. And anything can claim to be Christian. And so a lot of people out there, I believe, um, haven't caught on to the idea that so many of these movements, whether it be New Age, whether it be... Um, well, the purpose-driven life, so much of it is focused upon man instead of on God. And we're here to worship God, not man. A lot of this stuff is just about us looking for either our own force within us or manipulating what we would claim to be the Holy Spirit to get what we want. I mean, there's all that kind of stuff in play, and I know that's kind of a shotgun answer, but to, to a general question, yeah, there's an awful lot today that is, seems to be focused at man instead of God. Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, and uh, the Aleister Crowley, uh, Oprah Winfrey, touch on that for uh, a minute. Wow, there's a diverse uh, group or pairing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Aleister Crowley was a, the most feared Satanist of his time, and he, of course he's deceased. But, uh, I mean, he, he's the guy who was pictured on the front of the Beatles' uh, Sgt. Pepper album. And, you know, there's a reason he's on there, by the way. Somebody in the Beatles have been reading that stuff. There's a reason that Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin wanted to buy and eventually did buy the castle that Aleister Crowley once owned. I mean, these guys were enamored with occultism and Satanism, and Crowley was definitely into all that stuff. Yeah, um, I just noticed it, what I said. It was actually Er, er-, er- Tolley or somebody. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah, why I said yeah. that, dude. I think I was yeah, wrong. You, well, Crowley, Crowley doesn't have a connection with Oprah. You know, totally, but, right? as far as I know, anyway. But but uh, Eckhart Tolle is a different story. Eckhart Tolle, in his book A New Earth, is a book that Oprah Winfrey put in her book club, yeah. caused his book to sell a couple million copies more than it had already. He was a well-known New Age author already. Yeah. But uh, I, I've got a couple of videos uh, uh, in my YouTube site. I have a YouTube channel, as you do, and and uh-huh. folks can find that YouTube channel just by coming to ericbarger.com on our homepage, and they'll find. The YouTube logo, just click there and it takes you right to our channel. We have about um, 30 or 40 videos up there. I forget exactly how many, but there's a lot of them. One of them is a video of Tolly with Oprah Winfrey, and uh, yeah. it also shows Oprah making statements of why she left Christianity. And it yeah. was uh, totally, I mean, totally off the wall, the stuff she said. But uh, please, Oprah is a very spiritual woman, but I, I would hate to think that anybody who's listening who cares about the Bible, who cares about Jesus Christ, who would care about what absolute truth is. I would I would really hope that nobody would think that she is somehow a Christian. Um, I mean, she has perfect right to do what she's doing. She's not breaking the law. This is America. Thank God for our freedoms. But uh, we also have the freedom to warn you, do not follow the spirituality of Oprah Winfrey. 
Uh, It's a great example of the idea of looking inside yourself. And one of the uh, one of the uh, definitions I give for the New Age movement when I speak, and and of course I speak in conferences and seminars a lot. You know, that's my main focus is going out and being on the road. I'm on the road a couple hundred days a year and speak probably between three and four hundred times every year. Considering many of those uh, many of those days I'm on the road, I'm speaking multiple times, but. You know, one of the one of the, the ways I define the New Age movement is that it's any system that tells you to look inside yourself for enlightenment, wisdom, or power. Yeah. Now, I'll repeat that, and then I want to, want you to see how close that is to authentic Christianity. It's not, of course, it's off the wall, but it's very close. It sounds good, and unless you have discernment, which is what the church so desperately needs today, you won't know and understand that. But any system that tells you to look inside of yourself. For enlightenment, wisdom, or power is generically the New Age movement. Now, when when I got saved, at the very millisecond in time, whenever that was, and some people are fuzzy on when it might have been that they've come to Christ. I know when it was for me. In the middle of the night, February 1981, on a Sunday night going to an, into a Monday morning, I know when it was for me. But that second when I got saved, uh, the Spirit of God came to reside in me, which is what happens when you invite Christ to come into your life. Uh, yes. He promises the Holy Spirit is going to come and live in us. And yes. at that second in time when I got saved, I began to look to the Spirit of God for enlightenment, wisdom, or power. The problem is with, with Oprah and with New Age philosophies, they aren't telling you to look to the Holy Spirit. They're telling you to look to some impervious, in, in, impersonal God spirit. God spirit, or I'm sorry, God force, some uh, some other spirit that is within you. Sometimes to our human spirit, and if we look to any other spirit except the spirit of God for spiritual power or spiritual illumination, yeah. so the frank truth is every other spirit will lead us astray, including our human spirit. Every other uh-huh. spirit will lead us astray. Only the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. And if we listen to these other spirits, some of them sound really good to us. Some of them sound really – I mean, you you talk to people who are into channeling and into the idea of trying to contact the spirit realm, and they have gotten some tidbit of information from the spirit realm that has begun to be the the moniker of the way they lead their lives, the stuff they're going to focus their entire life around. They've had a spiritual experience, and they aren't willing to test that experience by the absolute truth of the Bible. And there's where so many people have gone down the tube and gotten in trouble because they, yes, they have these yes, spiritual yes. experiences without having any kind of absolute truth to test it with and, and to check it out with. And we're to test all the spirits to see if they're of God, as what it says in First First John chapter four and verse one. So that the Scripture gives us all kinds of information and leading if we'll just keep our Bibles open yes. uh, and keep reading and keep testing what happens around us by those things. Not by whether it's an actual authentic spiritual experience, because way too many people, Philip, and you know this, way too many people have had spiritual experiences, and that, for them, that settles it. Well, I had a spiritual experience. It must be from God. Well, that's not true. Just because we have a spiritual experience doesn't mean it came from God. Let's test it to make sure it came from God, to make sure it's not going to lead us astray. Because uh, yeah. every other spirit that's speaking out there that, that isn't the Holy Spirit, i got news for you, it is demonic. And we need to see yeah. it like that. Yes, indeed. I had um, attended a church a couple of years ago, and uh, I and I guess I can't get over this one. But he was asked. He told us to um, we if we uh, as associate pastor. He says uh, if you're hurt, um, if you if you feel a you know back pain or if you got a sickness, well, you, this is what you need to do. You need to say over and over again. You know, there's no place like home. There's no place. I'm just joking when I say that. But he was like, um, you know, I will be healed. I will be healed. And I, you know, he just kept saying it. Now, well, what do you, what, what do you think he was going with that one? I mean, you think that was some type of mysticism or something? That, and this is supposed to be a, a non-denominational, on fire for you know Christ Church. And then, and then I'll find one more thing he said. Uh, this is the actually is more important than the first one, but I, that's the first one I started off with. The second thing he had said, we were all in a, a group meeting, and I forgot, I don't know what meeting it was about, but anyway, uh, so long ago, he was like saying, uh, "You know that we are Christ," and I thought he meant we were of Christ, and I had my head down, I was, 
And I was like, please, you know, please repeat yourself. I, and I didn't say that out loud, but I was like, what do you please? And then he started going through the Bible trying to show us that we are Christ. Uh, can you go ahead and elaborate on that one? And then we're going to get well, into some of your books. <laughs> the, the, the second problem you bring up is way more trou- troubling me than the first. Exactly. That's what I said. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Any anybody who tells us that we are all Christ or little gods, uh, yeah. I mean that that is right straight out of occultism. That's yeah. that's more New Age than anything else. Um, as far as healing goes, I mean I I believe with all of my heart that God heals, God saves, and God delivers. He does those things. Yes, and he does. Uh, but I don't believe we can command Him to do those things. Or it's and as much. Exactly. I mean, what what you were describing is a, a a type of mantra, something that a Hindu would would uh, would uh, prescribe to, something that New Agers would do, where they would repeat a phrase again and again and again. That's yeah. the stuff that uh, contemplative prayer is all about. That uh, taking us back to kind of a road to Rome uh, inside the uh, emergent church movement. The idea of walking through a labyrinth supposedly is going to end your search for life's meanings. And I, I'm telling you, all this stuff. Uh, all this is meant to divert us from the pure and simple truth that Jesus came to set captives free and wants to heal and save and deliver, and he wants us to be his spokesman here on the earth. And, you know, I mean, it's just that simple. I'm his spokesman, but I'm sure not him. (laughs) Amen. Yes, yes, indeed. What do you um, uh, believe uh, is going on? Um, And I I love this guy, you know, but... I, and I'm not trying to cover for him or nothing like that, or I'm not trying to expose him. But I'm I'm, I'm exposing the truth, the truth versus a lie. What do you think when um, Billy Graham and Robert Schuler, Billy Graham was on Robert Schuler's show, and uh, and he was preaching or, or talking about the wideness of Christianity, the wild, the wideness of. Um, uh, salvation, or, or can you elaborate on that? Well, I want to give Dr. Graham the benefit of the doubt. I want to yeah. give him a lot of grace. I want to remember where he's at in life right now. And this doesn't mean that we can't be absolutely articulate and and completely biblical later in life. But yeah. you know, I mean, can I just say it honestly to say someone should try their very best to take the microphone away from him at this point? Because he has said things such as opening the uh, the door up for the idea that that Muslims are saved, and I mean this is it, it's a sad scenario. I don't think the Billy Graham of the 1950s would make statements such as we're hearing these days, and we're we're hearing less of them, thankfully, especially since Larry yes, King's off the air yes, because he would he would make these statements on Larry King and so on. And please, I don't want anybody to write me nasty notes about Billy Graham. God God knows yeah. that I I heard him early in my Christian walk. I'm so grateful oh, yeah. for the ministry he's had. I'm so thankful for his his life, yes. his testimonies, and the ministry he's leaving behind for his son Franklin, who, by the way, doesn't say any of that kind of stuff. But I know yeah. there has got to have been some conversations by those who are close to him behind the scenes saying you can't really mean these things you're saying. You can't really believe that there's a wide gate somehow, which is – that's the, the kind of uh, – I mean that's the impression he's living, leaving us with. Uh, in making some of those statements he's made both to Schuler and to to uh, uh, Larry King, and I'm sure in other places as well. So I, I just want to give him grace, and at the yes, same indeed. time, I want us to say, look, test it all. E- Billy Graham, I don't care who it is. Test yeah. If it's me talking, I want people to test yeah. what I'm saying to see indeed. if it lines up with the gospel. Yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Um, I, I had a friend um, just recently um, – me, I was visiting him, and we were talking, um, and uh, I never heard how he felt about, you know, Christianity. I haven't heard this full story, so we finally able to sit down and talk about it and just talk. And um, I was talking to him about um, faith or saving faith. Uh, produces fruit Um, and he took it to believe that I was saying that a person can be saved by works Uh, and I don't know how he got that so I was sitting there showing him the Bible and he was also 
uh, talking about, uh, uh, I was showing him the various uh, groups that were not into the kingdom of God, and he was actually elaborating that the grace of God can cover everything, even someone who is practicing the sin at that time. Um, what do you say to a person or a movement, and it, I'm pretty sure you got a name for this movement, who believes that easy believism, that um, we can get saved and produce no fruit and no change, no cr- change of creature. Now, I know I understand the process. You know, it's a life where you learn, sure. you fall, you get up, and you walk. And, but God produces power uh, for us to be, be uh, set free. All right. I know he set me free from various um, devices. So sure. what I'm trying to get to is, is there a movement that justifies everyone will go to heaven no matter what you're doing at the time of death? Okay. Uh, and can you elaborate on that? Um, let me say, first of all, that in no way do I believe in sinless perfection. Yes. Okay? I, I believe that there are as much repentance uh, that I practice even in my life today and not just even but as my life goes on it seems like god points out more things that he wants me to change in my life because he's interested in building my character and me and uh, i believe there's always going to be this this process and as you said that it is a process but uh you kind of have asked two questions i think uh you're asking is there a movement in christianity that uh that uh teaches such easy believism that people just have an impression that if they've just made a side swipe at Christ, that that's all that matters. I take it that liberalism? I, I, I don't know. Well, I, that's been all through. I mean, liberalism is built on works more than anything. It's not built really on a relationship with Christ. It's built on oh, how okay. good a person I am. And if I'm if I'm a good person, then, you know, all that matters is I do good stuff. And that's what so many of the uh, – the, the once very evangelical but now mainline churches are teaching in their seminaries and, of course, in their Sunday school rooms as well. So is there a movement that says, um, you know, if I just think the right things or think the right thoughts or, or if I just say, you know, Jesus come into my life and then I never repent of my sins, is there a movement like that? Yeah, there is. I mean, if you look at page 38, The Purpose Driven Life, you have an example of, of that very thing where the most known supposed evangelical preacher of our day, Rick Warren, uh, tells people if they think a little prayer that that's all they have to do, and now suddenly they're a member of the family of God. There's nothing in that book, nothing from cover to cover, that deals with the the, uh, the fact of repentance. And as I read the Bible, I believe the Bible te- cle- clearly teaches on more than one occasion that without repentance there really is no salvation. So uh, I think one of the things you might be getting at is maybe – People need to examine, am I really saved? Uh, have yeah. I accepted Christ? Have I, have I decided to move on with him? Have I turned everything in my life over? Uh, have I, to my best ability, repented of my sins? It doesn't mean that we're not going to sin, but are you repentant of those things? Yeah. It becomes some sort of an easy path. Now, that's one thing I think you're saying. The second thing is, is there a movement out there that says that everybody is already saved? And without any doubt, there is a movement right now, a growing movement, that talks about the idea that Christ, when he died on the cross, that means that everyone is now already saved, and there's no need to repent. There's no need for a personal conversion. There's no need to pray a sinner's prayer, for example, or a prayer inviting Christ into our lives, what we, what we commonly call sinner's prayer. I mean, yes. and those same people, that same movement, are also saying there is no divine retribution, there is no hell, that the substitutionary penal atonement of Christ uh, isn't what the church has always made it to be. Uh, Just recently, and I'll kind of give the the listeners uh, a clue of a great article I just read yesterday, uh, Dr. Albert Moeller, who is one of my favorite teachers, the guy is so Uh terrific. He's more Calvinistic than I am, but I can get by with that. He's written a great article about hell, two of them actually, part one and part two, that everybody ought to read. It's not that I think we ought to focus on hell, but we ought to understand there are a lot of people that are trying to do away with it just because they think it's so old-fashioned. And uh, hell is just as hot as it was the day I was born and a thousand years before, 
and it's going to be just as hot for all eternity, and just like heaven's going to be just as wonderful, and people should be trying to flee from from ever ha- from having any affiliation with going to hell in any way they can. <laughs> that's yeah. what that's what I exist, and I'm sure that's why you do what you do. This we're not yeah. just sitting here on the radio tonight or on the internet just trying to prove how right we are and how wrong we think others are. This is all yeah. about whether people get to eternity with God or whether they are doomed forever. And that's why I'm so passionate about this, about what I see going on in the emergent church movement and liberalism inside the church and and universalism being taught as normal in Christian churches. When I hear this kind of stuff, this is why my ministry exists, and I realize that it's been all these years in the making to get me to where I am now, that I can speak on these things and try to articulate some of these problems to make people think twice before they dive in to these uh, really specious belief systems that we see around us today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I'm going to swing somewhere else. You're going to almost think i got mental problems because it ain't got nothing to do with what I just, we just got to talking about. But talk to me about these movies that came out recently, like the Twilight and, um, and any other movie you can think of, even the cartoons that, that are out. Uh, talk to me what you know about Hollywood and its production of the movies. and What is its effect on the church and sure. and what's his opposition towards Christianity? Well, the, the the Twilight movies and books are so popular, especially among teenagers and teenage girls in particular. Yeah. Uh, I've been saying for a long time, what could make teenage girls have an affinity for vampires? And the answer to that is acceptance, because that's what they're offered by this movie. They're offered acceptance. Uh, that loners are offered acceptance inside vampirism, and uh, it's more than that too. Uh, it's a yeah. family. It's a unique family scenario that they've has been constructed in these movies. Of course, Stephanie Meyer, the author of the books, is a, is a Mormon. Some of her Mormon theology shows up in the books, and we wrote uh, a very quick and easy to read booklet about the Twilight series. And in it, I pointed out that vampires need blood to live just like yeah. Christians need Christ's blood to live. Yeah. That there's life in the blood, and vampires, the whole the whole idea of vampires, that this is something that people who are into occultism understand. But you and I understand that Jesus and his blood has changed us, and he is yeah. the, the atonement for us, you know. So there's a, a mockery of the blood of Christ going on. By the way, I have a this little book, but... People can download it from our website. It's easy to find on our website. Again, that's ericbarger.com, or they can request one. And uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but I better do it right now or I'm going to forget. Uh, Any of the listeners listeners that are uh, interested in our ministry, there's a link top left on our homepage. And uh, it just says something like, uh, heard Eric on radio or TV. I mean, that's the question. I'm going to go there and look at it, get the exact words. Yeah, if you found us through radio or TV, click here, it says. It's it's in yellow print. Uh, If they click there, they can fill out a form. We'll send them a free information pack. And in it, that will include not only a recent newsletter and some other information. It's also going to include a free CD of my message, The Most Dangerous Cult. And so... Uh, I'm going to offer that to anybody who writes us. If you're not currently in our database already, we'll be glad to uh, to uh, send you that. As long as you click on that link and fill out the form that's underneath that link, it says, if you found us through radio or TV, click here. It's right at the top of our homepage, ericbarger.com, actually right underneath my picture. And uh, they'll be able to, to get that free CD. Now, okay, as far as we... some of the other movies and cartoons, Phil, there's, there's so much of it out there. Uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to uh, go down the list of the top TV shows, the top movies, the top cartoons, the top books, the top video games, and the top Internet sites to realize that we are hooked on the supernatural. I yeah. point this stuff out in, in a lot of depth in the book Entertaining Spirits Unaware, yeah. and uh, that's uh, available several places. On, they can get it from our website. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, we are yeah. hooked on the supernatural, but the problem is in that. We are not hooked on God. Yeah. We want supernaturalism, but we want it our way. We want to form and shape and make it what we want it to be instead of what God's Word speaks to it. And God's Word speaks directly about this stuff. The problem is we don't want to listen yeah. to that. We want to, we want to follow this occult supernaturalism, and it's obvious the world is hooked on it. And I'll tell you where I think this is going, brother. I have, a message, I have a message about 
uh, the, the supernatural and the occult and the affinity that the world has for today and how that's a prophetic thing. I believe this is, this is part of Bible prophecy at work. And I, I won't get into all the Greek that I've uh, read to understand that, the Greek behind the words that we, that we read in our English Bibles. But I will, I will tell you this much. I believe the rise of the supernatural is a very prophetic thing. And I believe that Antichrist could not come until there was a sufficient conditioning or desensitizing period. And that's exactly where we are today. The world is in a conditioning period to condition us for signs and wonders. And let's look at how good the computer graphics are today, even in the advertising. I mean, you and I, we all watch ads on television that are so real, you have to go, how did they do that? Mm-hmm. And uh, we are being conditioned to accept supernaturalism as normal. And yeah. nobody, no generation has ever gone through this kind of thing before. And now we are pr- pretty much prepared that when Antichrist shows up, we won't think, think anything about it. In fact, a lot of people in the culture will say, boy, he's got the power that I want. That's the stuff I've watched on video games for years. That's the stuff I've fed myself every Friday or Saturday or every Monday and Tuesday, whenever it was, at the movies or on television. And, and you take a look around. The whole culture is addicted to supernaturalism. But once again, it's a conditioning process, and I believe this is exactly what Paul is talking about in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, yeah. in, that, in this message I've got about the supernatural and Bible prophecy, uh, you know, I go through nine verses of Second Thessalonians 2. It takes about a half hour to go through those nine verses and to explain what is being said by Paul, what the warnings he's given the Thessalonians. And this is some of the best input we have in the Bible about the end times. And he's warning us that this stuff has to happen. When it says the coming of the lawless one would be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, you look at that that word coming, for example, and that's one of the English versions of the Bible I just quoted. The word coming there is about the time period before he actually appears, and that's right where we are today. Yeah, in that be, period yeah, approaching be. the Antichrist, yeah. we'll we'll be we'll go through a conditioning period of counterfeit miracle signs and wonders. Well, take a look at what you're seeing on television, uh, on in the movies, and on the video games. Those aren't real. Those are counterfeit miracle signs and wonders. And I believe that the, the Greek so clearly paints this picture and gives us such a, a a real, accurate view of the very day that we live in today. I believe that the rise of the occultism and supernaturalism that we see through the media is a, really a fulfillment of um, of one of the many fulfillments we see of Bible prophecy. Yeah, um, the supernatural says that um, in the book of uh, Revelations, uh, it talks about uh, the image of the beast and, and all these other things. And it also says, um, uh, I forgot what book it is. You probably can help me out here. Where the, uh, I think it's the Revelation, when the false prophet calls fire from down on earth uh, in, the, in, the, in the sight of um, uh, the Antichrist. Uh, so it seems like a, a lot of mysticism is going to be taking place. And then the Bible says that, and he should, and God should send them a strong delusion, and they'll believe the lie. Um, yeah, now that's just, that's Second Thessalonians chapter two that you just quoted yeah. uh, that part, and, and that's exactly right. And there's going to be a lot of mysticism and a lot of miracle signs and wonders going on when Antichrist shows up. However, what I'm talking about is before Antichrist shows up, there'll be a lot of things that will look real but won't be. That's what a counterfeit is. Are in you other words, it's all or, about. It's, I'm sorry. Are you? Uh, do you believe the? You believe in the rapture, right? You betcha. And I'm a pre-tribber. Yeah. Uh, however, I've I've got great friends who are post-tribbers, and yeah, me too. we have great conversations about it. I never break fellowship with people about it. It's yes, not indeed. a central essential doctrine. I think it's a very important doctrine, but not something I would ever break fellowship about. Uh, but you know, I believe there's going to be lots of counterfeit signs and wonders take place before Antichrist shows up just to to condition the mindset of the people. And, and that's that's what I see going on today. I, yeah, I, I got a whole set of doubt about it. So, uh, I'm sorry? The UFOs, the UFOs, um, what part would they play? Would they play any part in the strong oh, I think that's I think that's part of the conditioning. 
I, yeah. People are so seeking for for uh, supernaturalism. I, I believe that we know what the UFOs are. If people have indeed had encounters with the UFOs, which I, I happen to believe they have, I believe they're not unidentified. I believe we can identify where they came from. I believe these things are demonic apparitions. And, of yeah. course, there are a lot of people in Christianity today who are trying to somehow marry Christianity up with secular science, which is a mistake. Uh, um, Christianity should never be at the mercy of the secular scientists or educators. We're trying to marry it up somehow so we can um, gain some sort of, of respect in their eyes, which I really don't care to have. If they don't want to come to Christ, they don't want to accept him by faith, I can't help them much. And, uh, yeah. and it, won't, it doesn't help the, the cause of Christ in trying to somehow water down Christianity to make some secular educator happy or some secular scientist or curriculum writer happy. And I, I think a lot of them uh, have come to the conclusion that UFOs must be from other planets. And I tell you what, if I ever have an encounter with a UFO that appears to be some sort of a spaceship, the first question I'm going to have is, who is Jesus Christ to you and do you serve him? Yeah. You know, that's the question I'll have because that, that really will sum up the whole deal. Uh, everything in this universe is subject to God and his son, Jesus Christ. And, and if yeah. we have that view as Christians, if we understand it like that, then at that point we understand everything else will then fall in line. If we understand that everything is subject to God and God has given us his word, he is he's not uh, – he's able – to to keep his word and he's not let it go by the boards. He has kept his word. He if he's the god of the universe that can make you and I and he could uh, instigate DNA and if he could make the stars we see in the galaxies at night when we look out in a starry night, if he can do all that, he can he can keep his word and he's given us his word to follow. And this is the the whole deal of life for me is to follow what his word says. Yes, indeed, that is that is the truth. What is uh, the cult of relativism in your book? Well, uh, relativism, you know, I mean, there it's all around us. It's the idea that you make up your rules. A lot of people would call it postmodernism. See, if we yeah. don't have absolute standards, then we're going to believe relative standards of morality. We're going to accept relative standards and principles about what truth is. You know, a lot of people say, well, look, you know, I, I know that God loves me. I'm a good person, and I'm I'm not as bad as Osama bin Laden. I'm not as bad as Adolf Hitler, so I know that I'll make it into heaven. I mean, I've had yeah. people tell me that to my face yeah. in churches. And I'll just say, look, when does God grade on a curve? How are you getting that? You don't find it anywhere yeah. in the Bible. But this is what people, you know, they want to believe that God will judge them based on they're not as bad as somebody else or as so-and-so in history. So relativism, that's how relativism has come in, to water down the gospel. And, and, you know, it seems awfully cold and hard. You've heard this before. It seems so cold and hard and callous by we evangelicals who are really evangelicals, who really believe the Bible, who really want to follow his word, when we make statements like, you know, people are going to perish who don't want to follow what God's word says. And he doesn't make up uh, subjective rules along the way. He doesn't base his judgment uh, upon people's lives in eternity uh, based on his feelings. He wishes yeah. none would perish. The Bible teaches that. He wants yeah. all to come to repentance, but that's the story. He wants us all to come to repentance. In other words, we come to Christ and we repent. And so um, a lot of people just want to have it their way. You know, This is part of the homogenizing of Christianity to make it more of what man wants it to be instead of what God wants it to be. Yeah, exactly. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, phony baloney. Uh, what about our purpose driven? Um, uh, what is uh, what is this? Well, I mean, what's the main purpose of purpose driven? <laughs> if you mind me asking. Well, <laughs> I uh, I wrote a, a thirty page, eight and a half by eleven size page paper about this. People can get it either in print from us in our bookstore on on the website or. They can download it as a PDF file up online on our website. We, wow. we have, by the way, about a thousand pages, more like eleven hundred pages of documentation on the website now. So it's just not some sort of an advertisement for the ministry. It's a resource center, anyway. And when I wrote that, I mean, I took took my time. I talk about eleven different 
uh, things in the Purpose Driven Life, 11 different principles that I believe are non-biblical. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's it starts out, the Purpose Driven Life starts out with, with Rick Warren making the statement that, remember, this isn't about you, it's about God. And then the rest of the book, the entire book, is about us. <laughs> it's about what we can get out of Christianity. It's yeah. not about serving, worshiping him. It's about us. And yeah. uh, it also includes the whole, you know, as I already pointed out, the, the whole notion that you don't need to repent to become a Christian, that you just think a little prayer and suddenly you're saved. That's on page 38. Yeah. What Warren has done, uh, you know, the Purpose Driven Life is the is the keystone of his of his life. And mm-hmm. it's made him who he is. It's obviously made him a multimillionaire, which I'm I'm not, not opposed to the free market system working. Mm-hmm. But I want to point out it's given him um it's given him a a position, if you will, a place where he can now speak to other things. This is why he goes up to Yale University with a number of the heretical professors and theologians up there and signs a paper declaring that Allah and Jehovah are the same God, even though every Muslim cleric, who be honest with you, will tell you that's, that's not accurate. But here's mm-hmm. Warren falling in step with these other evangelicals, including Robert Schuller and so many others, yeah. and Leif Anderson, and I could go on and on, who have signed this paper saying that Allah and Jehovah are, are the same God. And, and yeah. so the, it's the homogenizing, the drawing together of world religions into one system. And let me tell you, brother, as you already know, because I know what your show's all about, mm. you already know that there's got to be a world religion in place when Antichrist shows up. That'll be one of the three tiers of the Antichrist system. And it yeah. won't be formed just after he shows up. It's got to be well in place beforehand. And this yeah. is what we see today when we see people who claim to be evangelicals, such as Rick Warren and Leith Anderson, joining hands with Muslims. And as this happened last week, you may be aware, they joined hands. uh, The NAE, the National Association of Evangelicals, had decided Mm -hmm. to join hands with Mormons and basically give Mormonism a pass. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the stuff we see going on all around us today in the day we live in. I'm telling you. If these aren't the signs that Jesus is ready to return, I don't know what there is. There, there are so wow. many of them out there, so many things that, that paint the picture that we need to be ready and watchful and proclaiming his truth before he gets yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. And, I, and I'm glad you touched on that um, as far as the messing up of uh, the different religions um, because I, I, I know – that God is trying to point into me something that is taking my hard-headed um, views a while to figure this out, but it's almost as if all roads are leading to the same spot. Um, and and it's a development. It's even even outside of the religious circles, even in the secular circles without, you know, religion. Everything is, is, is they out there are teaching me, 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 the me society, which in turn is religion because you're focusing right back to yourself and you're number one, you're number uno. So everybody seems to be performing religious acts. It's just a matter of uh, what you're doing. Um, like, for instance, a you know, beautiful, innocent, older lady at the old folks' home is knitting and crochet. I mean, whatever her focus is, God bless her, um, that's uh, somebody might say. Well, religion is not around this individual person, but society teaches us that we should focus in, uh, and, and it's natural because when I mean, you're not going to take care of your own self, even the Bible addresses that as a husband. What kind of husband who won't should love his wife should be? What kind of husband who ain't going to take care of himself or love himself? But the Bible never addressed it uh, addressed to us to love ourselves. If you ever notice that. The Bible right. never addresses the individual. Now it relates to the wife. A husband should love his wife as he loves her himself. And it addresses the fact that the husband's supposed to be loving himself because that's a natural thing to be happening. So um, the difference between Christianity is it focuses on Jesus Christ as Savior of the world, and through him, his vehicle, the church, through the Holy Spirit, preaches the gospel. But other religions teach self-worship. You're going to be able to 
to come back as a rotten potato. I mean, it, it teaches, you know, um, self-esteem is going to be able to be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, even TBN demotes, uh, uh, this is what I want to talk about. I don't, I'm sorry I even blabbed my mouth for that long. You got me excited. Man, I wish <laughs> we could go for three hours. But, uh, well, here, here's one thing I wanted to ask you about, and, and I'm sorry I talked so long. TBN, some of those guys on TBN, God bless some of them, uh, but um, I've seen and heard, um, I don't know if you ever, you know, Hank Hennigram. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. But um, he, I don't like everything he does, but he had uh, written a book called uh, Christianity in Crisis. And it was it was sort of like he had played out a role uh, play uh, where he, he would uh, uh, preach the word. He would uh, articulate these guys and their movement through a story. And these guys were talking about they were demo, it seems like they were just like the Mormons they were demoting Jesus, promoting Satan, and then putting themselves on even par with all three of them. That was really weird by itself. Well, um, it, it's let's take it out of the sphere of just TBN. Let's just say, you know, well-known Christian leaders, some on TV, some on radio, some not, but. Each and every one of them, we need to put to the test of what the Scripture says. Yeah. See, that that's really the bottom line. Does yeah. the Scripture say what they are saying, what they're what they're preaching? And I, I put myself in that camp. Anybody, you, all of us, we all yeah. should be tested by our listeners. That way, yeah. the listeners will first. Hey, look, if I'm testing what somebody else is teaching, that means I'm reading the Scripture, I'm searching the Bible, I'm being what the, the book of Acts calls a Berean, I'm checking out what is being taught around me to make sure it's of God. Remember, the Bereans tested what what uh, the apostles were teaching to make sure it was of, of God. How much more do we need to be doing that today? Certainly more than, uh, or as much as in the day of the apostles. We need to be testing it ourselves. And yeah. so, uh, and I can't speak for what Hanegraaff might have said or, or not said per, per se, and and uh, you'll not find any links to Hanegraaff's site on my site, but that's a, that's a completely another story and for other reasons, only because I was a, a great fan and was mentored by Dr. Walter Martin and, and yeah. uh, will forever be thankful for his memory, and that's something that I don't see a whole lot going on there at, uh, at uh, CRI right now. But anyway, we can pray yeah. for a difference on that. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, uh, I, I would love to get you on um, again. It's uh, kind of hard when you just all of a sudden just start because uh, I started looking at your your site a couple of days ago, and I decided today just to go off one book. And uh, entertaining spirits have been something uh, that's uh, uh, caught caught my attention for the last couple of months about the. Um, Production of movies and cartoons and video games, um, and that's that's something that's gotten me. Then there's other things where it's you have a book on the cult and, and the new age movement, and it's just so much to cover. It's just like, and then I got yeah, excited I at the end, so I was like, oh, "Man, that's good. That's no problem, brother. I'm I'm glad to be on with you." And uh, yes, again, I encourage folks to go and and uh, and uh, just click the link about rate being hearing me through radio and TV, and we'd be glad to send them a free info pack and a, a free CD as well of the, of the message I mentioned earlier. So, um, All right. Thank you really so much, Really appreciate brother. it, Phil. Uh, God bless you. You have a wonderful week. Thanks a lot. Nice to be with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back in a second. We'll be back. What you just heard was an actual recording of my daughter's heartbeat within my womb. And ever since my husband Jeff saw our moving, active, vibrant daughter by way of live ultrasound image and heard her precious heartbeat within the womb, he's been horrified that we as a society legally kill our children at this stage of life. As a society, we legally kill our children. This is the greatest human rights issue of our day. To join in the conversation, Fridays, 9 to 11, visit WeKillChildren.org and find the show. That's 
WeKillChildren.org. Y'all have a wonderful day. See y'all later.